everybody. We will commence with our hybrid uh, council study session. This is on Climate Smart San Jose special meeting. Uh, and I guess we should go first to roll. Tony. Yes. Here. Owen? Here. Here. Roscoe? Rock. Davis? Here. Here. Esparza? Here. Arenas? Foley? Here. Mahan? Here. Jones? Present. Cardo? Present. Present. We have a form. Okay, thank, thank you, Tony. Tony. All right, uh, Jennifer, did you want to kick this off or should we give it to Carrie? Yeah, I think we'll just turn it right over to Carrie Romanow, our Environmental Services Department Director. Great, thank you, Carrie. Appreciate all the work of you and your team across all the departments, transportation, plus so many are involved in this effort. And we, uh, we thank the C team for their hard work and the great collaboration with many outside partners uh, that have really brought us so far already. And I know we have ambitious goals ahead. So Carrie, take it away. Uh, Thank you. Hi, Carrie Romano, Environmental Services Director and Chief Sustainability Officer. I'm joined here in chambers by Julie Benevente, Deputy Director for Climate Smart, and Jessica Zink, Deputy Director with Department of Transportation. We also have two guest speakers today that we'll introduce as we go um, throughout the presentation. And since Climate Smart really covers many departments in the city, we also have on Zoom from PBCE, Chris Burton, Michael Brio, and Ed Schreiner and from DOT in addition, in addition to Jess, John Risto, and from Community Energy, Zach Strike. Um, in the audience today is also with ESD, Yale Kissel, and Elena Olmedo. Uh, before we dive in, also wanted to give a shout out to all the city departments as each department has engaged on climate and equally important, extend my appreciation to internal and external stakeholders that supported, advocated, and frankly pushed us to do more. Today's meeting's objectives are to create a basic understanding of current climate science and why urgent action is required, talk a bit about the city's climate smart plan, our progress, and current activities, set a new aspiration by adopting carbon neutral San Jose by 2030 resolution, and with those in mind, let's go to uh, the state of climate. Um, sorry, forgot about the advancing. Um, so as we start our discussion with, as we start our discussion with the larger world context in mind, so we can understand true urgency of climate, I'm excited to introduce Michael Mastrandia. Michael is a research director of the Climate and Energy Policy Program and a senior research scholar at Stanford's Wood Institute for the Environment. He also serves as chief advisor for energy and climate research at the California Energy Commission. Michael was part of the leadership team for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Fifth Assessment Report, where he helped lead the development of two international scientific assessments of climate change, science, and policy options. He has also served as an author for the fourth U.S. National Climate Assessment and an associate editor for the climate, California Fourth Climate Change Assessment. He has a PhD from Stanford's Interdisciplinary Program in Environment and Resources and a BS in Biological Sciences from Stanford. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Michael. Thank you, Carrie. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to first thank the council and the Climate Smart team for inviting me to speak today. Um, and I am, as you've heard, a, a climate scientist who's working on climate risks and resilience and also implementation of climate and energy policy here in California and beyond. And I've been asked today to speak about the findings of the recent IPCC Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that was released in August and some of its implications. Next slide, please. I wanted to start with just a couple of comments about how science and scientific consensus works in this context when you're talking about the climate system and understanding how it's changing. I know when I was in school, science was taught as more of this house of cards kind of a model where scientists have a hypothesis, they do research, they do experiments, they gather evidence, and if the results are consistent with that, that hypothesis, they keep going and they continue to build confidence in that. If they get a different result, they throw everything out and they start over. Um, and I think that that's not really the way to think about scientific consensus. In, when we're talking about climate change, we're talking about our understanding of how the climate system works. It's 
much more like a jigsaw puzzle. Different pieces of research are being used to understand different pieces of how the system works and what's driving the changes that we're observing. And even if there are some uncertainties in particular aspects that are still being narrowed down, we understand how the basic system works and we understand how it's changing. And, and that's really where the science is in terms of climate change and, and the motivation for understanding how our actions Professor, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. To interrupt. Um, um, we're having some uh, audio difficulties that your voice appears a bit faint and tends to run together quite a bit. Perhaps there might be an adjustment to the mic. Or, or simply, simply speaking, speaking. Is that much, better? Better. Much, 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 much better. better. Thank you. That's much, much better. Can you hear me better now? Yes, yes that's excellent. excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm concerned you can't, you can't hear, hear us. us. Let's see. I'm sorry. I, I could not hear you. But let me... Oh, okay. okay. Well, well, we can, we can hear, hear you a lot, lot better. better. I, I wish you could, could hear us. us. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie, you want to try talking? Maybe it's my mic. Okay. okay. Great. Great. So, we're so we're doing much better. Uh, go for it. Thank <laughs> you. I will keep going. I, my apologies for that. I'll go. Uh, some kind of technical issue. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, next slide, please. So what I'm going to be speaking about today is this IPCC uh, report that was released in, in August. Uh, this is the first installment of IPCC's sixth assessment report um, and is a report, if you can go to the next slide, uh, that is um, the first uh, of three volumes that will be released. This one focuses on the physical science understanding, the physical science basis of how we understand the climate system. And there will be reports that are released early next year on both the impacts of climate change and options for adapting to those kinds of changes, and then also reducing emissions, the mitigation of climate change. Both of those will be released next year, but are not yet out. So today I'm going to be focusing on the uh, a report that focuses on the fifth uh, or the uh, the climate science, the physical science basis. And I wanted to say briefly that IPCC was created in the late 1980s. Its members are the governments of the world, and the scientists of the world come together to write these reports. The objective is to provide governments with policy relevant but not policy prescriptive information. Oh, well. And so scientists in general volunteer their time to work on these reports and assess the state of knowledge, what we know about the drivers of climate change, its impacts and its risks, and also how adaptation and mitigation or emissions reductions can reduce those risks. And so this report uh, that I'll be talking about today was based on assessing more than 14,000 scientific publications around the world and is intended to give you a sense of, of what we know and uh, what are some of the implications that policymakers internationally and in, in areas in California and in, in the cities of California might want to consider in terms of taking action. Next slide, please. So the, the first of these uh, conclusions from the report is that climate change is widespread, rapid, and intensifying, that we're already seeing climate change manifesting in many different ways around the world. And because the impacts part of the report is not yet out, I also borrowed a finding from the last report, the one that I worked on some years ago, that increasing magnitudes of warming increase the likelihood of severe, pervasive, and irreversible impacts. So these are some of the high-level findings from these kinds of reports. Next slide, please. You may have seen a figure like this. This is a graph showing the global temperature increase over time since the end of the 19th century over the last 150 or 170 years. And this, you can see this kind of gradual warming trend where temperatures are in general increasing year by year, particularly over the last 50 or 60 years. I think it's easy to look at this kind of a figure and, and see this as this sort of gradual global trend. Things are changing a little bit each year. It's getting a little bit warmer each year, um, that kind of a thing. And I think it's really important to understand uh, that the ways in which climate change and this kind of a warming trend manifest are very different. Next slide, please. Those increasing global temperatures are having fundamental and profound impacts on many types of extreme events, both in terms of their frequency and, and in terms of their severity. So that's things like heat waves, extreme heat, heavy storms, drought conditions, wildfires, and also the air quality effects of wildfires, sea level rise. 
that warming trend that I showed you is, is changing the patterns of these kinds of extremes. And, and personally, these are the kinds of, of, of impacts of climate change that I think are most concerning because these kinds of events are really when we see big impacts on, on people and on our communities. And I think also underscore the reason why there's this urgency to act to curb the worst impacts of climate change. Next slide, please. So another finding, again, from this physical science report that, that is out uh, now is that many of these kinds of changes that we're observing in the climate are unprecedented in thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years. In other words, they're not somehow part of the natural cycle where we've seen these kinds of changes before. Instead, there's something different and there's something unusual. Next slide, please. One of the ways that this report tries to demonstrate that is, is with this figure. This is looking again at global temperatures. And on the right-hand side of the figure, the black part of the figure is showing the same uh, temperature record that you saw before over the last 150, 170 years. That's where we have direct measurements from thermometers and more recently from satellites of what the temperature is in the world. There are ways that scientists can use to look further back in time using ice cores from Greenland or Antarctica, lake sediments, a whole range of other things that where scientists can look at those factors or look at those records and tie them to what the temperature was at the time uh, it, further into the past. And so this is looking 2000 years into the past. And you can see that in general, there were uh, temperatures that were sort of inching downward, cooling slightly until this most recent 150, 170 years when you see this really rapid warming that is very different than anything that was observed earlier and is much larger in magnitude as well. Next slide, please. I mentioned ice cores. Scientists can use ice cores to go even further back in time, in this case, looking 800,000 years back into the past, specifically at the carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere, one of the major greenhouse gases. And you can see this period or, or this, this pattern in, in the figure where the concentrations are higher and then lower and it kind of goes back and forth. This is the ice age and warm period or interglacial cycle that the earth has gone through over hundreds of thousands of years that has been driven. And these changes are generally very slow across tens of thousands of years. It's driven by small changes in the orbit of the earth around the sun. And you can see that the, the temperature or the, the carbon dioxide concentration has gone up and down in a, in a fairly defined range. And then it's compared to more recently on the, on the right hand side where we are today or, or a few years ago. And again, we're much higher than this kind of natural cycle that was observed before. And again, it's an indication that this is something that is unusual and, and driven by different factors. Next slide. I think one of the most important conclusions from this report uh, is this one, that it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land. And this word unequivocal, when scientists make these kinds of statements about what is causing what, in this case, that human activities are causing the warming that we're seeing, Scientists usually speak in terms of probabilities or likelihoods. They say it's likely that. They use qualifying language. This kind of a statement that you see here is about as strong language as scientists ever use. They're, uh, they're, the, the authors of the report are really trying to communicate, I think, that this is something where there's overwhelming evidence. It's really established fact. There's no question that this relationship and that this is what is happening. Next slide. We know, and I'm, I'm sure you'll talk more about this uh, later on, we know that the burning of fossil fuels and all of the human activities that lead to the burning of fossil fuels, as well as other activities like deforestation or other kinds of land use changes are adding carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. About half of what we currently add is being taken up by plants on land and some of it mixes into the oceans. And the other half is staying in the atmosphere and building up year by year. So this is again showing uh, CO2 concentrations, carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. So this is really the driver of the warming that, that we've seen. And if you could go to the next slide. There are a lot of uh, pieces of evidence that scientists use to show the human fingerprints on the warming that we've seen. I wanted to show just one of them, again, from this most recent IPCC report. We only want, have one Earth, and so we can't do experiments on the Earth by changing what happens and then seeing what the effects would be that scientists would usually do. 
but we can use computer simulations of the Earth system to run those kinds of experiments. And that's what scientists have done in, in this figure. The black line here in this figure is again, what we've actually seen in terms of, of temperatures and, and temperature change over time in the world since 1850. Uh, the tan or the orange band that's around that is climate simulations, computer simulations, including both the human activities, the burning of fossil fuels, deforestation and other land use changes, um, as well as natural changes that can affect the, the Earth's climate, which include, as I mentioned before, changes in how much energy is coming in from the sun, as well as major globe, uh, volcanic eruptions that can change uh, and cool the Earth on, on a few years time frame at a time. And so combining both of those, leads to uh, temperature changes that look something like and very similar to what we've seen uh, in, in reality in, in, in our actual Earth. And you can contrast that with the teal or the blue band that's down below, which takes away the human factors and only includes those natural factors. And you can see that you really can't explain the warming that we've observed over the past 50 to 60 years unless you include those human factors. They're really the driver, particularly of that warming that's happened over the last several decades. Next slide. In my last few slides, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the, the choices that we have and the implications of those choices. Another finding from the report is that future changes to our climate and, and how they affect us depend on the choices we make today. There's a certain amount of climate change, as we've been talking about, that uh, has already occurred. And there's some more that's already baked into the system because of emissions that have happened to date. But, and this is the, another finding of the report, strong and sustained reductions of emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases would limit climate change, would avoid some of the climate change that would otherwise happen in the future. The report also makes a fairly strong warning uh, that unless there are immediate, rapid, and large-scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, limiting warming to close to 1.5 degrees Celsius or even 2 degrees Celsius will be beyond reach. And those temperatures that are mentioned there are, of course, linked to the Paris Agreement. Those are the targets that have been set globally to limit the impacts of climate change uh, and are really where all of the governments of the world are, are trying to aim to in terms of the international negotiations and then down to uh, the actions that are be being taken in different countries and different regions. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Another part of the urgency of taking action I, I wanted to show is, is this slide, which was uh, put together by the United Nations uh, Secretariat that's running the meetings that are going on in Glasgow, Scotland right now, the Conference of Parties, the international climate conversations that are occurring. The, under the Paris Agreement, countries submit national commitments of what their country is going to do to reduce emissions. And this UN Secretariat has put together the implications of all of those national commitments to say, what would this mean globally? That's the red triangle you can kind of see near the top of this, the NDCs, the nationally determined contributions. Those are currently, and this is looking out to 2030, are on a trajectory that's much more like a three degrees Celsius world rather than a two degrees or a 1.5 degrees Celsius world, the targets that have been set by the Paris Agreement. There's a fairly sizable gap between where we're headed currently and emissions uh, trajectories that are consistent with those lower temperature targets. So this is another part of the urgency. More action is needed than is being taken now to be consistent with the, where, we, where the Paris Agreement has set us to head. <clears throat> Next slide. And, and lastly, I wanted to just say that I think that it's really important to have these conversations because California and its cities have an outsized influence on, on climate solutions, and that goes um, for here in the U.S., but also for around the world. California and, and its cities, and including the city of San Jose, have really been leaders in terms of the policy conversation on climate policy, also in terms of technology innovation and other aspects of the solutions to climate change. And even though uh, the emissions that are local are one small part of the global emissions, the outsized influence, I think, that is so important about the, action, the kinds of choices that can be, be taken is that uh, understanding how to create effective and equitable solutions is something that others in the U.S., others in the world can copy and really scale to make that global impact. 
but we have to start in terms of, of what the actions we are or we can take um, that, that happen locally. And so I would like to hand it to Julie in closing. If you can go to the next slide, I just want to thank you um, for, for having me and please feel free to follow up with me if you have questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so, so much, much Michael, Michael, for, for providing, providing us with, with that incredible, incredible basis for the, for the conversation, conversation today. today. Really, really appreciate it. it. Um, and, and I think, I think as Michael said, in talking, talking about the urgency, urgency of climate, climate change, change um, uh, that cities do have a great opportunity here to be role models in, in terms of the solutions. And San Jose in particular has a leadership role to play. We're the 10th largest city, as you all know. We're home to a diverse population, including disadvantaged communities who will be most impacted by climate change. San Jose was one of the 25 cities and the only Northern California city awarded the American Cities Climate Challenge through Bloomberg, Bloomberg Philanthropies in 2019. The Climate Challenge demonstrated our unique ability to, of cities, including ourselves, to deepen and accelerate climate action. And together, the Climate Challenge cities are expected to reduce emissions 32% below 2005 levels by 2025, surpassing the uh, Paris Agreement goals. So we have a lot to be proud of at what we've done in the last couple of years. I wanted to give a little bit of uh, a basis also for Climate Smart. We adopted Climate Smart in 2018. It's a city's climate action plan. It is aligned with the Paris Agreement. As you can see here, we have energy, transportation, and water conservation strategies, which are encompassed within the three primary pillars of Climate Smart. And those strategy, strategies focus on goals and metrics to increase renewable energy, reduce water use, make buildings energy efficient and all electric, increase electric cars and transport, shift to biking, walking, and other low tra emissions transport options, and make smart land use decisions to reduce vehicle miles traveled. The city's general plan, which is the guiding document for the city through the 2040 horizon, is an essential building block for the plan. From the outset, Climate Smart was intended to be updated as needed, but at minimum after the four-year major updates of the city's general plan. And given the general plan's current update cycle, we anticipate updating Climate Smart in fiscal year 22-23 to at least include any relevant general plan updates, inclusion of any new focus areas for Climate Smart, and any new city goals. Each strategy included in Climate Smart is linked with specific metrics and milestones to measure our progress and measure it publicly. We track our metrics on the Climate Smart dashboard, which is available on the city's website. Staff also completes greenhouse gas emissions inventories for community wide and municipal operations, switching between the two each year. Looking at our most recent community-wide greenhouse gas emissions profile completed in 2020 using the 2019 data, transportation represents over 50% of the city's emissions, and 88% of those transportation emissions are from on-road passenger and, and commercial vehicles. The built environment, which includes electricity and natural gas emissions shown in orange here, uh, also are a, a significant source of emissions for the city, and they account for about a third of the city's community-wide greenhouse gas emissions. I think it's important to note, too, that while electricity can ultimately come from clean power sources, um, natural gas is inherently connected with greenhouse gas emissions as well as significant indoor and outdoor air quality impacts. And that's why the city continues to focus on phasing out natural gas usage in our buildings. In terms of our current greenhouse gas reduction goals and progress so far, we're definitely on the right path. The blue line represents our business as usual projection from Climate Smart um, at the time that it was created in 2018. The reddish purplish line there represents Climate Smart's pathway to emissions reductions aligned with the Paris Agreement goals to keep global temperature rise below two degrees Celsius. And the city's commitment to ICLEI's race to zero shown in gold sets our reduction goals even higher, aligning with the Paris Agreement goal to keep global temperatures below 1.5 degrees Celsius. And we should be proud of where we're at and keep pushing ourselves to ensure that we reach our goals as we move along. In terms of our accomplishments in Climate Smart, this isn't the full list, but we just wanted to highlight some of the activities and um, policies and programs that are shown at left on this slide that city staff and um, together we've all accomplished since the Climate Smart plan was adopted. 
They include implementation of San Jose Clean Energy citywide in 2019, adoption of the Natural Gas Infrastructure Prohibition Ordinance in 2019, and expansion of that ordinance in 2020 to all building types, installation of 53 miles of new bike lanes, including 12 miles of all ages and abilities, bikeways in 2019 through 2020, adoption of our electric mobility roadmap in 2020, and the installation of over 2,000 new publicly accessible EV charging stations. And the city's climate efforts are being recognized. At the right on this slide are just some of the awards and accolades the city has recently received, including the Carbon Disclosure Project A-List, which we just heard today. Uh, we're on the A-List again for this year, coming up. We're one of 88 global cities recognized um, in terms of our accomplishments there for climate action planning and disclosure. We also received the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy City Scorecard Top 10 in 2020. We fought really hard to get into that top 10. And the scorecard assesses the efforts of 100 major US cities towards equity, sustainability, and climate action. We also received the Shining Cities Top, 20, top 10 Award in 2020 for both solar installed and installations per capita, the Spur Impact Award in 2020 for our building reach code, incentivizing all electric buildings, the big city, the big U.S. city with best electric vehicle charging infrastructure from Rocky Mountain Institute in 2020, and the 10th greenest city in America from Walnut, Wall, Wallet Hub in 2021, um, which assessed 100 large cities in the U.S. on sustainability and climate action. And we continue to push forward. The Climate Smart Core team has six primary focus areas that set a foundation to support and facilitate the programmatic work throughout the city. We host monthly cross-department staff level technical working group meetings and director level steering committee meetings and facilitate coordination across departments. To support our efforts, we focus on acquiring and leveraging external funding and resources. We maintain an online Climate Smart dashboard tracking our metrics as I described earlier. We complete GHG inventories every year, and we spend time building community, regional, and statewide partnerships to align and collaborate on Climate Smart initiatives. We also plan and conduct Climate Smart community engagement. And I just wanted to highlight one of the um, key tools that we use in our community engagement, our online platform, the Climate Smart Challenge. We have Currently have about 700 San Jose residents taking action on the platform to reduce 115 tons of carbon, equivalent to taking 106 cars off the road for a year. This uh, platform is translated into Vietnamese and Spanish, and with it, the user can identify climate actions they can take and make plans for future activities and collaborate with a team or a neighborhood. We know that where we're at right now is a great start, and we also know that we can do more. We're currently focused on working on developing a team-based engagement platform, utilizing the platform to accelerate community, climate, and resiliency efforts. The memo attachment provides detailed updates on Climate Smart initiatives, and we've talked about some of these in, in past updates on Climate Smart, um, but we wanted to just list a couple on these slides and um, share some with you. On the transportation side, a lot of work has and continues to be done to lay out and implement plans to shift to electric vehicles and shift to public transport, bikes, walking, and other e-mobility options. In the Water Conservation Department, we continue to support initiatives to reduce potable water usage, including promotion of water rebates, water conservation education and tools, and pilot programs. On the energy front, city initiatives such as the ones highlighted here are furthering our building electrification, energy efficiency, and clean power goals. City staff are also leading two special projects to address two of the focus areas that were identified as needing further research and analysis when Climate Smart was adopted in 2018. The Climate Smart Solid Waste Element, which will look at how waste reduction and handling activities can lead to reduced community wide emissions results, is underway, as well as the Climate Smart Natural, Natural and Working Lands, or NWL, element, which will look at protecting how we can protect and manage the city's natural and working lands to lead to further carbon sequestration and reduction results. The NWL element is being completed in partnership with the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority with joint uh, project coordination as well as funding. And we did want to spend a little bit of time uh, on a project highlight for the NWL element. 
Um, we have, um, I'd like to introduce Jake Smith, who's the Conservation GIS Coordinator with the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, and he's going to run through our NWL element update. Jake, if you want to unmute yourself. Jake, we're still not able to hear you if you're trying to speak. <clears throat> there, there's, there's, there's no, no Jake, Jake in, the, in the Zoom meeting. Jake's not listening to us. <laughs> Maybe we can come back to that section. Uh, I found him. Oh, good. Hey, welcome. Hey, Good to have you. I'm Thank sorry you so we, much for having. We locked you out there. <laughs> oh, the, the, I'm glad we're getting all this uh, squared away at the beginning of the presentation. So, thank you, Julian. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon, esteemed mayor and council members. I'm Jake Smith, the Conservation GIS uh, Program Manager at the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. Thank you so much for having me here today, and I'm pleased to be able to provide an update on the natural and working lands element for Climate Smart San Jose, where we're working on identifying how the city can leverage its natural and working lands to help mitigate greenhouse gas emissions and the effects of climate change. Um, and I'd like to congratulate the city on its accomplishment, accomplishments and the Environmental Services Department on this very timely and innovative project that builds on that great work of climate leadership and connects it to state and local efforts to implement this work locally. So to start, what are natural and working lands? Uh, natural and working lands generally comprise large undeveloped areas that broadly include forests, woodlands, riparian areas, wetlands, farmland and rangelands, and even large urban green spaces. So about 60% of land within the city's sphere of influence is generally considered a natural and working landscape. And some examples of natural and working lands include the San Francisco Bay Area Wildlife Refuge to the north end of the city, Alamar Park in the hills to the east, Coyote Valley to the south, and the Guadalupe River Park in the urban core. And the city's general plan also includes land use designations that generally fall within these categories, including uh, open space, parkland, habitat, agriculture, and open hillside land use designations. And the reason natural and working lands are so important from a climate perspective is that they remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, so actually pull it down and then store it in the vegetation and soils that provide important services or benefits to us, like flood protection, safeguarding our local water quality, local food security, supporting biodiversity, and mitigating heat islands. Next slide, please. And the strategies that we use to protect or manage these landscapes influences the type and amount of benefits that they provide and who benefits from them. So generally, these natural working land strategies fall into four general categories land conservation and supportive policies that help protect natural and working lands from conversion while also supporting the infill and development that cities need to grow, land restoration that actually seeks to restore and expand natural and working lands where they may have been cleared in the past, regenerative agricultural practices that increase farming and grazing operations ability to capture more carbon from the air and improve ecosystem health, and even urban greening strategies that seek to bring nature-based solutions like street tree planting and urban forest expansion into the city's urban core. Next slide. So since early last year, the city and the authority have been working on the development of a jointly funded natural and working lands element to explore where and how these strategies can be applied in the city and what kind of climate and environmental benefits are possible. And so this work is being done by mapping the city's natural and working lands and using spatial modeling to see where these strategies can be applied under different land use scenarios. So for example, in a land use scenario by directing grant growth away from Coyote Valley and into transit oriented infill areas, the city can lower per capita emissions and allow for large scale restoration of lands to store more carbon 
and protect local food, food security and uh, make local wildlife populations more resilient to climate change. Or by expanding the urban forest at nearby or in vulnerable communities, the city can reduce the urban heat island, remove pollutants from the air, increase uh, urban biodiversity, and provide urban green spaces close to our communities. So in the staff report, you can find a link to the Natural Working Land Elements Technical Report that provides detailed documentation of these different natural working land scenarios that were modeled and how these strategies perform. And now the project team is using this information to develop natural working land metrics, milestones, and potential implementation strategies that will then be incorporated into Climate Smart San Jose itself. Next slide, please. And stepping back, this work is not being done in a vacuum. The natural working land element complements many state and local efforts that provide the policies, partnerships, and funding that would enable early implementation of this work. So for example, the governor of California signed an executive order late last year that sets a statewide goal to protect 30% of the state's natural working lands by 2030 and to use those lands to help combat climate change. Likewise, under SB 27, which was recently signed into law, the state will now even set up carbon sequestration goals for natural working lands and create a registry of local projects for potential funding. And then following this, just weeks, weeks ago, the state made a $15 billion climate package budget allocation that literally sets aside billions of dollars for funding and implementation of natural working land strategies locally. And looking locally, city actions to redirect growth from Coyote Valley, funding land conservation through innovative measures like Measure T, and redesignating lands to ag and open space lays the groundwork for the city to continue to be a leader in this space, including exploration of innovative policies like a potential proposed Coyote Valley Environmental Credits Program that could generate offset credits for urban projects while also funding land conservation, or the Coyote Valley Conservation Area's Master Plan, which will develop a vision for how open space, how the Open Space Authority will restore lands to make our community's environment more resilient to climate change. Next slide. Key findings from the Natural and Working Lands Technical Report underscore the importance of the city taking advantage of this moment in time to use natural and working lands to meet its environmental and climate goals. First, natural and working lands can provide significant greenhouse gas benefits. Addressing global warming will also benefiting our local communities through the co-benefits that they provide. Second, Actions that protect our natural and working lands from development can provide immediate emissions avoidance benefits and promote growth in urban areas. And lastly, these strategies literally take time to grow and we must act today to yield the benefits of tomorrow. Next slide. So with that, I'd like to thank the city and its staff by highlighting next steps for the natural and working lands element. The project team expects a draft natural and working lands element in December, facilitated by stakeholder engagement in January. And a final natural and working lands element would be available in February and brought to the city council for consideration of approval in spring 2022. Uh, and that's the conclusion of our presentation. I'd like to hand it back to Julie. Thank you, Jake. Um, I'm sure there'll be uh, many questions for you on uh, on that report, but really appreciate your partnership in uh, working through the opportunities and challenges of not only getting the project done, but um, next step figuring out how to implement it. Um, we talked, so, so far today, we've talked about kind of why the, there's urgency to act and why the next 10 years are so important to our global climate. We talked a little bit about all the progress the city has made in the last three-ish years since Climate Smart was adopted, which is why I think we can do even more, even faster um, with the right level of focus. And so that leads us to, do we want to take a next step forward? Um, do we want to um, move forward with our recommendation to adopt a carbon neutral San Jose by 2030 resolution that uh, is aligning with a lot of the global and state initiatives to make significant progress by 2030? So that would commit to address the urgency, inspire our community and funders, and lead with boldness, making San Jose the largest U.S. city to have a pledge to go carbon neutral by 2030. Um, and with that, staff are available for questions. Great. Thank you very much. 
Terry and Julie and Jessica and everyone. Um, let's go first to members of the community. I want to thank the many active members of the community um, in this effort who have pushed us in so many ways around green buildings, around bikeways, around San Jose clean energy. We've had just wonderful engagement from the community. Okay, hi, this is Tony Tabor, City Clerk. It looks like we have nobody in person, so I'm gonna call the Zoom speakers. I have Dashiell Leeds, followed by Tessa Woodmancy. Hello, my name is Dashiell Leeds. I'm the Conservation Assistant for the Sierra Club Loma Prieta chapter. We're in strong support of this carbon neutrality by 2030 goal and of the city's commitment to environmental justice by equitably engaging the community. This target may be called aggressive by some, uh, but we would call it necessary. Based on the most recent IPCC findings, the resolution before you today is actually the normal expected behavior in response to a climate crisis of this urgency and magnitude. So we hope the council sends a unanimous signal to the community and to other jurisdictions that our society must urgently transition off of fossil fuels and that cities can lead the way. This resolution is another step in the right direction, but a resolution is only as good as the action that follows. Uh, we really appreciate the reports by staff today, and we think they're working on some really awesome projects. And we look forward to these increased greenhouse gas reduction targets being incorporated into the update of the Climate Smart Plan in the form of stronger measures. We sent a letter to the City Council, co-signed by Mothers Out Front and Silicon Valley Youth Climate Action, which supports the resolution and calls for seven actions for the city to implement and consider in its climate actions going forward. I'll cover a few of these now. Uh, first is that we hope that carbon offsets are not a part of carbon neutrality for the city's definition and that the city achieves these reductions through real world fossil fuel reductions within city boundaries. And in addition to pursuing aggressive fossil fuel reduction policies, we hope San Jose also commits to protecting and expanding biodiversity, which provides a variety of health and climate resiliency benefits, such as flood resiliency and reduction in the heat island effect. Uh, we support the protection of habitat and expansion of the city's tree canopy. And we also strongly support the protection of Coyote Valley through changing the land use designations in North Coyote Valley from industrial park to open space, parklands and habitat with the remaining areas changed to agriculture. To support climate action, we hope that the city will allocate sufficient personnel resources towards ecosystem protection and climate action. So let's back this target up with the funding and support that climate action demands. Thank you. And we hope you vote yes today. Tessa Woodmancy, followed by Blair Beekman. Thank you, uh, Tessa Woodmancy. Yes, carbon neutrality has the problem of that word net. And that means that, you know, how much are we taking out? And like my husband, the biologist says, even when we plant plants, they're part of the carbon cycle. So the only way you can really get carbon out of the, the CO2 that we have been emitting from um, burning of fossil fuels is over geological time. So it takes, you know, thousands of years to turn it back to, you know, into, and, and you know, it's, it's not, it's not really doable. And so, yes, we need to, um, you know, I love what he was talking about in growing our agriculture. And I've been talking about that with you is that we need to be planting a, you know, we need to have urban agriculture. And that's what Allery Middlebrook has been about, eat, grow, learn centers. And the, you know, learning to, you know, grow food, to, to deal with the wastes, our waste and everything to be hyper local and to learn sustainably living on our planet. We all need to do that. And that is what can unify us is, is working on that. Uh, but you know, this, this issue of the net is, is where you know, we get problems because we think we can, um, but we really have to, and that's what the prior speaker from Sierra Club, we appreciate, he's saying we need to take the real action to reduce our fossil fuel use. And we know that a lot of that is in transportation. And how do we create a, a ban cars? We need to really ban cars. And that is really where it, it comes down to. And, um, and then we need to you know, really create, then we will have walkable, uh, bikeable communities. And that's what we need to really wor be working on. And, um, and also creating really slow streets, you know, to, you know, to really control the streets. So there's 20 miles an hour, which is you know, livable streets. And we don't have that yet. And then creating you know, the agriculture that we do need to bring our um, growing of our food locally. We need urban sustainability. And so we need to realign, it's all in land use and we need to put our money where our mouth is. And Blair Beekman followed by Joshua Quigley. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thanks for the meeting today. 
Um, I guess to start, uh, I, I felt, you know, this, this, the beginning uh, lectures were kind of a bit skimpy. It was nice to have a person from Stanford speaking. Um, I expected to learn a lot more from this and I was not given very much information and that kind of hurts uh, for what, you know, this is our enjoyable, good stuff. This is our positive sustainability on our future. I, I don't see why you have to skimp on, on giving the information out for such a good uh, item for ourselves. And um, I know Tessa, Paul and I used to always talk that, you know, it's time we need to start, you know, making the, the uh, you know, staff informational reports more open and more just informational. And it's okay to do that. You don't have to fear doing that. I know over the past years, few years, with the tree issues, for instance, uh, you know, the, the department itself, it, its studies process hasn't been so in tune with community. And I hope we're working that out and, and, and it's learning to trust, you know, to create an openness to do that. Good luck how you can do that. Um, climate smart issues implies that there's gonna be technology involved. There wasn't there. Is there going to be any talk of, uh, you know, open public policies and how this can help the whole process of of creating good community practices for these items in our future? Um, that's important also. Um, oh, and finally, yeah, uh, Mayor Licardo, he's done a great job in talking about bringing local procurement ideas to ourselves as a local community. Let's really work on renewable local procurement ideas. It can really help us out of upcoming possible natural disasters. How do we plan and prepare for that? It's with good local procurement of renewables. Thanks. Joshua Quigley followed by Sarah. You see? Joshua, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, this is Josh Quigley from Save the Bay. I'd just like to start by saying how appreciative we are to Carrie and city staff for being proactive about addressing the role that San Jose should be playing in mitigating climate change. Given the impact that climate change is already having on our region, Save the Bay urges you to support the carbon neutral San Jose by 2030 resolution. While San Jose is already implementing a variety of climate mitigation strategies through its cutting edge climate smart San Jose, as today's presentation made clear and the Chronicle also noted this morning, Bay Area cities must do more to prevent climate disaster and secure a more sustainable future for their residents by reducing emissions faster. This, res uh, this resolution will help San Jose lead in that respect and prioritize the health and safety of San Jose's most climate vulnerable residents. But we can't recognize the urgency of climate change without also acknowledging the need to adapt to the impacts that are already being felt. That's why we're also asking for your support today to amend Climate Smart San Jose with a new section focused on climate adaptation and resilience. As we pointed out in the past, the absence of adaptation is a liability for the city and one that places most vulnerable residents at even greater risk. We're grateful for Mayor Licardo and Council Members Perales, Davis, and Jimenez for recognizing that shortcoming and offering a memo today that directs staff to incorporate adaptation and resilience into Climate Smart San Jose. And those efforts should prioritize resilient infrastructure like storm stormwater and tree canopy and other multi-benefit solutions that help the city to adapt when mitigation efforts uh, can't prevent changes. Um, these strategies should be focused where the need is the greatest. San Jose's neighborhoods dealing with flooding and extreme heat and co uh, compromised air quality and should be incorporated into other city planning processes should, such as bike, uh, bike plans and the general plan update. So Save the Bay is eager to offer our support um, and we urge you to support today's resolution and uh, greater adaptation and resilience efforts. Thank you. Sarah, followed by Bruce Nagel. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Sarah el uh, I represent NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, I'm here today to express the strong support of NRDC and 15 other partner organizations who've signed a letter of support for your review to pass the carbon neutral by 2030 resolution. Uh, San Jose has proven itself to be a national climate leader and this kind of ambitious climate action will reverberate across the country for other cities to replicate. Uh, San Jose's residents need this action now, especially low income and communities of color who are already disproportionately suffering the consequences of climate change. Um, to achieve this goal, this goal, one early action we uh, recommend is to work together with overburdened communities to eliminate emissions from urban freight 
targeting medium to heavy duty delivery, uh, these trips are often concentrated in vulnerable communities. So in partnership with the state, local and national partners and San Jose's environmental justice communities, this resolution will make San Jose a better place to live. Uh, so we do encourage the council to pass the carbon neutral and that is zero emissions by 2030 resolution today for the climate and the community. Thank you. Bruce Nagel followed by Brian Schmidt. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and uh, on the ambition of the plans and the things that you're working on. Um, one of the things that I think needs to be stressed is you first off mentioned as some of the previous speakers have the facts that this is causing things now in terms of problems. Um, we also have to consider the fact that we're leaving our earth to um, our children that follow on from us. We need to make sure that we take care of them as part of the process of, of addressing that. The key to making this whole thing work is to actually deliver on the uh, and fund the programs that are needed. Um, it's going to be important to, to have that happen so that uh, these uh, bold designs actually get implemented. And again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak and by all means, remember the children. They're the ones who are going to inherit what we leave them. Thank you. Brian Schmidt followed by Bruce Carney. Uh, good afternoon, Brian Schmidt for Green Foothills. And I want to start by expressing our appreciation that in the memo from the mayor and council members Jimenez, Perales and Davis, that the second extraordinary accomplishment bullet point for accomplishments to date is the land purchased and protected in Coyote Valley. So we, we support the city's approach to climate change and the proposed resolution. And we thank the council, especially for its past action in 2018, pushing for the development of a natural and working land strategy. Um, and we specifically support the staff recommendation for the development of a natural and working lands element. So uh, we suggest the council specifically direct that work to, to continue on the timeline specified in the staff report. Um, and further regarding protection of Coyote Valley as a climate accomplishment, uh, please keep that up. You have another chance to complete this work by approving the Coyote Valley staff recommendations eight days from now. And then finally, as part of the natural and working land strategy, it's important to recognize that farming is viable and can succeed there and be part of that natural and working land strategies. For uh, council members, staff, and members of the public, 18 minutes of your time is all you need for proof that it's viable. That is the length of the presentation by Santa Clara County at the Planning Commission meeting on October 27th. If you just go to the video for that meeting, fast forward to one hour, 57 minutes in, and you can start watching that uh, 18 minute discussion. So the credits that are being proposed uh, as a system for uh, for transferring credits is uh, environmental protection is also important uh, piece moving forward. And, uh, and we also are supportive of a better or an inclusion of adaptation and uh, thank the council and staff. Bruce Carney followed by Wyan. Bruce Carney. Uh, Bruce, you unmuted there for a second. There you go. Go ahead. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I am the chair of Carbon Free Mountain View and the founder and a board member of Carbon Free Silicon Valley. Um, I, among many others, look to San Jose for leadership in a wide variety of fields, not the least in climate action. And while your decisions about, about this topic will certainly focus mostly on the needs of San Jose residents and businesses, I want to make sure that you're not unaware of the leadership that you show and how other cities nearby will follow you. Um, a long time ago, I heard a quote from Governor Jerry Brown in his first term saying that political leadership consists of finding out where the parade is going and getting in front of it. And certainly the parade in this part of the world is toward climate action, early climate action, and uh, setting aggressive goals and achieving them. 
So I hope that you will inspire us through your decision to pick the 2030 date for carbon neutrality. Mountain View's date is now 2045. And if San Jose says it can be done 15 years earlier than that, I'm sure Mountain View will adjust its targets and behaviors to match yours. Thank you. Wyann Trong, followed by Carol Watts. Hi. I am Wayne Trump with Mugs Out Front and Turn Out for Transit. I heartily support the joint letter from Sierra Club, Mothers Out Front, and Silicon Valley Youth Climate Action. Please vote yes. We must also prioritize removing carbon from the atmosphere as well as reducing emissions. And food-related climate impacts are not sufficiently counted within the city and county and may outrank transportation. In the U.S., we waste 40% of the food produced Food waste is number three on the drawdown list of top 100 solutions to reduce and even reverse the climate crisis ahead of even transportation and building decarbonization. San Jose separates organic matter at the waste treatment facility, which is a good start, but much organic matter is contaminated or lost. Please plan in organic bins and in educating the public about the critical role of clean compost in regenerative agriculture, which actually removes carbon from the atmosphere and reduces methane produced by organic waste in the landfill. Also, please educate about the benefits of plant-based eating. Eat it even just once or twice a day. Also, very high on the drawdown list, and it improves our community. Prioritize uh, transit methods such as uh, traffic signal preemption, dedicated bus lanes, and transit-oriented development. Also, I urge you to prioritize sustainable transportation by streamlining and expediting climate-friendly changes to existing Measure B projects, including ending or completely replacing the Charpa project, horribly out of date and out of step with the community of color and school that has been allowed to grow there, out of step with climate justice, health and safety measures, and the climate crisis. Um, I appreciate the, the work you and staff are putting into this. I know it's not easy. Thank you. Please vote yes. Carol Watts, followed by Linda, Linda Hutchins-Knowles. Oh, yeah. Yes, my name is Carol Watts, and I'm with the League of Women Voters of San Jose Santa Clara. And we strongly support the Carbon Neutral San Jose by 2030 resolution and the reaffirmation of a climate emergency declared by the City Council in 2019. League organizations at all levels support aggressive measures to combat climate change. We will be so proud when San Jose becomes the largest city in America to set a goal of becoming carbon neutral by 2030. We want to express our gratitude to the thinly staffed city team that worked on Climate Smart San Jose. We applaud the goals mentioned in the memo from the mayor and council members Jimenez, Parvalos, and Davis, especially those that ensure equity such as tree planting in heat island neighborhoods. The League of Women Voters has long worked to preserve Coyote Valley. Therefore, we are in strong support of incorporating a natural and working lands element into the Climate Smart Plan. Thank you for convening this special meeting to take meaningful action and vote yes. Thank you. Linda Hutchins-Knowles, followed by Jenny Green. Hi, this is Linda Hutchins-Knowles. Good afternoon, Mayor Licardo, Vice Mayor Jones, and council members. Um, I live in District 9, and I'm wearing three hats today. One is as the co-founder of Mothers Out Front Silicon Valley, the other in my new role at Actera, electrifying transportation, and third as a mother of two teens whose future is on the line. We sent some letters to you, so I'm not going to go into all of the details of that, but I did want to lift up three key components. First, the equity piece. When the first Climate Smart Plan was developed, um, it was a really good start, but I think all of our eyes have been opened to the really importance of including communities that are most heavily impacted um, and communities that have been underrepresented, their voices being at the table. A really good example is the lack of tree canopy, the tree inequities that we see in our city with some districts having like up to 9% tree cover and others less than three. And so if we involve communities that are most heavily impacted, they'll have innovative solutions that will help protect people today from the effects of the urban heat island crisis, as well as draw down carbon. 
I also want to look at the fact that we need more funding. The thinly staffed um, Climate Smart team has done a tremendous job with the resources they have, but they really need more people to be there to help guide this new version of Climate Smart, the update, and to order to reach the target of 2030 carbon neutrality. And so I hope that when you do the budget proposals and budget negotiations for the new year, that you will significantly boost the funding for the environmental services staff, particularly Climate Smart. And then finally, um, I urge you as you look at the REACH code that you passed in the gas ordinance to please do a study of how many greenhouse gas emissions are being generated by the use of fossil gas powered fuel cells. This is a study that we need to know the answers to. We need to know how much is being caused by that. Thank you very much and please vote yes. Jenny Green followed by Colin user one. Hi, my name is Jenny Green and I'm a San Jose resident and a mother, member of Mothers Out Front. And I'm here today because I'm one of thousands of mothers across the city who lie awake at night worrying what the climate crisis will mean for our children's future. I just want to say, I think this is a great resolution. Please vote in favor of it. And then let's make sure we do the work to make sure we really do get to net zero by 2030 um, from you know, giving proper staffing to environmental services department to achieve everything we need to achieve to you know, taking those steps to I know there are a lot of steps that are going to have to be taken to get there, but this is a great start. And if you guys do that, you will be heroes. Thank you. Call in user one, followed by Robin Romer. You guys are going to get to zero carbon in 2030. Do you really think this is possible? You guys are obsessed with this, with this number zero. Is it going to be year zero, like Pol Pot's uh, Khmer Rouge? I don't know. It seems as if anybody on the left is, a, is really, really, uh, and, you know, impressed with something zero, zero population growth, zero guns, zero uh, gun ownership, uh, zero traffic fatalities, zero everything, right? Zero rights. I think it's crazy what you're trying to propose. It's not. It's not feasible. It's not going to work. It's, it's, it's a fantasy. It's a utopian fantasy that you're trying to perpetuate on people to maybe get more money out of people through fines, fees, taxes, regulations. It's a moneymaker. That's what it is. Keep in mind that these carbon credits were supposed to be traded with Ken Lay, Enron. And it was in a Michael Moore uh, film, uh, and Al Gore was pushing this. I'm sure he's a god for all you people there on the city council. He was pro he was proposing carbon credits that he could trade with Ken Lay at Enron. Think about that. Watch the Michael Moore movie. Uh, I forget which one it was, but he talks deeply about it. As for Coyote Valley, forget it. Make it a county park or something. It's a flood zone. Let the people farm it or whatever. There's no way you're going to have enough infrastructure to go out there. That This city cannot handle the infrastructure within city limits, let alone miles and miles out of town. Completely insane. You guys can't even handle the fountain at the Rose Garden. Well, you're you're going to have police and fire and and all this infrastructure out there in Coyote Valley. Robin Romer, followed by caller six six four eight. Good afternoon. Um, always a pleasure to speak after the last speaker. Um, I'm very supportive of the general direction the city has taken here, and I'm thankful for all the grant funding staff is pursuing to implement it. But I also believe that the true test of the city's resolve is when there are funding opportunities that contradict our climate goals. Let's say, for example, someone would offer the city $27.5 million to build a new road next to a public school to make it easier to drive and increase VMT. We need to not only pursue the good things, but also stop doing the wrong things. On that note, and in regards to the recommendation 1D in the memo by the mayor and others about the relationship between development projects and climate goals, I'm all in favor of building more housing, especially affordable. I would like to ask you to clarify that this recommendation relates only to housing and commercial projects and not transportation projects. Even Caltrans has recently clarified that for transportation projects, any increase in VMT, regardless how minimal, should be considered a violation of climate goals. And it's hard to call you a climate leader if your climate plan is less strict than Caltrans. 
we probably all agree that we can't fight this climate crisis by making it easier to drive. Thank you. Caller 6648, followed by Amanda Bancroft. Hello, my name is Andy Wonder and I lead policy for E2 on the West Coast. E2 is a national nonpartisan group of business leaders and investors who advocate for policies that are good for the economy and good for the environment. I am here on behalf of our California network, including more than 30 business leaders living and working in San Jose. E2 strongly supports adoption of the carbon neutral San Jose by 2030 resolution. But this goal is a critical next step to ensure continued progress towards a sustainable 21st century San Jose economy. Bold climate action is an economic imperative, and this goal will provide important market signals to drive investment in the city. Notably, the goal will build on the city's building decarbonization leadership by driving local job growth and investment in energy efficiency and electrification upgrades in the city's existing buildings. In achieving this goal and transitioning to clean energy, the city's economy will benefit from reduced public health impacts. Toxic local air pollution caused by burning fossil fuels poses a significant risk to public health and therefore considerable economic costs in the form of healthcare expenses, decreased work productivity, and missed work days. And with jurisdictions through the U.S. advancing climate action, this bold leadership will move will provide a first mover benefit and prepare San Jose's economy to compete in the 21st century economy. The economic opportunity is clear. E2 and our community of business leaders call on you to support this resolution, and we look forward to working with the city to develop and implement a more detailed plan to meet the goal. Thank you. Amanda Bancroft, followed by Justin Wang. Yes, hello, council and presenters. Thanks for the great presentation. Uh, my name is Amanda Bancroft. I'm with 50 Silicon Valley and leading their San Jose climate team. Um, I would really like to urge the city to continue leading the Bay Area in sustainability and pass this resolution to become carbon neutral by 2030. As the science shows, we need to take aggressive action to combat climate change, and we need to do so with equity at the forefront. I would also like to advise the council to leave offsets out of this resolution, as the past has shown these can sometimes increase the city's emissions. Thank you for considering this urgent and much needed resolution. Please vote yes. Thank you. Justin Wang, followed by Susan Butler Graham. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Justin Wang with Greenbelt Alliance. So San Jose residents are already suffering from the impacts of the climate crisis with our frontline communities being clearly disproportionately affected. Just over the last year, our communities have been hit by unhealthy smoke and air pollution from fires extreme heat, drought, and the continued threat of sea level rise. Residents need bold action now. Greenbelt Alliance supports the, strongly supports the carbon neutral by 2030 resolution. Your approval of the carbon neutral by 2030 resolution will reinforce San Jose's reputation as a US leader on climate action. Again, mitigating the emissions from transportation, decarbonizing our existing buildings, and protecting our natural and working lands are all critical climate action. In particular, protecting our natural and working lands are a crucial multi-benefit solution that not only supports the climate, but biodiversity and habitat as well. Given the critical role that they have to play, Greenbelt Alliance also strongly supports the creation of a natural and working lands element and urges you to do so immediately. Furthermore, in a week, you will have the opportunity to protect part of one of the most precious open spaces in the region, Coyote Valley. We urge you to keep in mind the climate crisis as you make your vote. Again, we strongly support the carbon neutral by 2030 resolution and hope you will solidify San Jose as a climate leader. Thank you for your time. Susan Butler Graham, followed by Andrew Boone. Good afternoon, Mayor Licardo, Vice Mayor Jones and council members. I'm Susan Butler Graham, I'm in District 9, a mother and grandmother and volunteer leader of Mothers Out Front Silicon Valley. I'm increasingly upset and panicked about what the planet will look like for my children and my granddaughters and for all children. That's why I strongly urge you to vote in favor of the carbon neutral by 2030 resolution. Now, adopting the resolution is the easy part. The hard part will be ensuring the targets are reached by doing some things, um, enhancing ecological resilience by protecting Coyote Valley and expanding tree canopy, uh, as soon as possible, studying the impact of gas-powered fuel cells in San Jose. 
securing funding for the equitable electrification of existing buildings, and allocating more personnel resources to update and implement the Climate Smart Plan. We need more staff to be able to do these things. So we need funding for them. By committing to carbon neutrality by 2030, and then, re and then allocating the resources necessary to achieve it, San Jose will be a model of climate leadership for other cities and for the world. Thank you for protecting the health and safety of all children. My granddaughters are counting on you. Thank you. Andrew Boone followed by Moria Mer Merriweather. Thank you, San Jose City Council members. This is Andrew Boone and this is definitely the right goal to adopt. This is a goal uh, driven by science. And uh, it's, it's heartening to see the city council adopting goals uh, driven by science rather than capitalism, which is what virtually all of the rest of the policies are based on. Bring more corporations, let them do basically whatever they want, whether it destroys our society or uh, the environment. And uh, so this is a good plan. Many times San Jose has good plans, but you need to follow this plan up with meaningful action. For example, it is still the city's policy to spend a pittance on uh, fixing streets so that they're safe for people to use other modes of transportation than driving cars, like walking, bicycling, and skating, riding the bus. If you have only spent $10 million so far in five years since the Vision Zero plan was passed to reduce car crash deaths to zero, and you're planning on spending over $100 million just to build one new interchange at Zanker Road and Highway 101, the priorities are completely backwards. This is not going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions when you're trying to build new interchanges. Mayor Sam Licardo, you have been a very staunch supporter of building a brand new interchange at Zanker Road and Highway 101 to accommodate more car traffic. And this will cost probably several hundred million dollars. Those projects need to be canceled. The city council needs to vote to override Mayor Licardo's climate destroying policies. We cannot have more cars and climate protection at the same time, even if those are electric cars. Electric cars consume a large amount of energy and produce large amount of greenhouse gases. Thank you. Moira Merriweather, followed by Diane Bailey. I'm Moira Merriweather, I live in San Jose. I'm in favor of the resolution you have before you to become climate neutral relative to the data that is counted by Climate Smart San Jose. I'm here to talk about that the data included does not go far enough. It seems that Climate Smart is based on greenhouse gases created in San Jose, but not the climate costs of food and the materials that are used in San Jose. A particularly relevant and significant example is the greenhouse gas costs of the meat and dairy sold and consumed in San Jose. Looking at the plan, I know it doesn't include meat and dairy sold and consumed in San Jose, because if it did, then reducing these greenhouse gases would have to be a major part of the plan. The meat from cows and from sheep measured in edible weight or by calorie are the most costly foods in our human diets in terms of greenhouse gases. There are vastly differing estimates for the percentage of greenhouse gases due to animal agriculture. The figures vary from about 18%, which is more than all of transportation, to about 51%, huge amounts regardless of which statistics we use. As consumers of meat and dairy, we in San Jose must take responsibility for the huge disturbing levels of greenhouse gases from food production if we are going to be realistic about our lives. The Climate Smart Plan in its current form encourages employees of San Jose and residents of San Jose to treat meat and dairy as an afterthought and not to take these costs seriously as central parts of our collective bottom line and not to work collectively toward improvement. Further, San Jose is not taking the level of responsibility and leadership that is needed to make enough change and take full responsibility for the dire climate situation we find ourselves in. Please take action to include greenhouse gas costs of food and materials used in San Jose, including the greenhouse gas costs of our food, and to become carbon neutral relative to these greenhouse gas costs. Thank you. Diane Bailey. 
Good afternoon, Mayor Licardo and council members, and thank you for the opportunity to comment. My name is Diane Bailey. I lead Menlo Spark, a community climate nonprofit working towards a zero carbon clean energy future for all of Silicon Valley. We strongly support and urge you to adopt the resolution before you to make San Jose carbon neutral by 2030. And we're very grateful to staff for all of the work that went into this. I wanna echo the comments of my colleagues about the importance of equity, appropriate staffing levels, recognizing the health co-benefits of climate measures, and especially the importance of city leadership. San Jose helped set off a wave of action to phase out methane gas with its gas ban in new buildings. That was a transformational measure and exactly what we need to address the climate crisis. We need more of those decisive and transformational actions to create a zero carbon city if we wanna have any hope of achieving a stable climate in the future and averting the worst impacts. We're already feeling the impacts of climate change here in our communities with the second worst wildfire season ever on record this year and the associated hazardous air quality from the smoke. We're also facing more intense heat waves and extreme weather disruptions. Let's recognize that we're in a climate emergency and act accordingly. I hope you'll support this important carbon neutral by 2030 goal as the responsible action to take. Let's all do our part towards a climate safe future. Thank you. Virginia Holtz. Are you, can you hear me? I am. Yes. You, you can hear me. Okay. Um, I urge the council to adopt the carbon neutral resolution and support the North natural working lands for all the reasons provided in the Open Space Authority presentation today. In addition, there is something missing in the report titled Climate Smart San Jose, a people centered plan for a low carbon city. What about a healthy city? As we reduce our CO2, we become a more healthy city with fewer deaths due to heat and less asthma due to cleaner air. Climate smart should include benefits of trails and parks with tree canopies that absorb carbon and help us obtain being a cool city. We need sequestration as well as lowering our CO2 emissions. I urge you to direct staff to provide new pillars in the future reports that document health benefits that assist city becoming a low carbon city. Examples should include community forest plan with metrics and traffic, tracking. Thank you. Back to the chair. Okay, thank you. Um, Thank you to all the members of our community who uh, came out to speak. We're very grateful to our many, many external partners, uh, all the many individual members of the community, as well as the NRDC, Sierra Club, Mothers Out Front, Silicon Valley Bike Coalition, Fossil Free Bay Area, Open Space Authority, Save the Bay, Bloomberg Philanthropies, many, many others. We appreciate your ongoing support. Also, just want to emphasize, in addition to the folks who were speaking, of course, presenting today, I want to also thank Lori Mitchell uh, over at Clean Energy Shop. Uh, John Risto, Matt Kano, um, and Elena Almedo, uh, all, and many other team members who worked so hard. Um, I know uh, a lot of uh, really important people flew out to Glasgow, uh, and uh, they made lots of speeches and uh, held press conferences and made big pronouncements, and then they got it back in their jets and they go home. Uh, and I think we all know that the real work gets done in local communities. And uh, I'm grateful we've got an amazing team here uh, and that we're all willing to roll up our sleeves. And so I certainly strongly support making San Jose the largest city in the country to set the goal of becoming carbon neutral by 2030. Um, but we know if we all agree on that, then the hard part just starts. <laughs> and now we've got to accomplish it. And I know that the direction suggested in the memo uh, has us setting about uh, on very specific strategies and how we're going to get there. I, I think the good news is, is that what we've seen over the last decade has really been tremendous here in the city. And um, because of the hard work of so many people, I think if you had asked us a decade ago whether we would have accomplished all these things, we'd, we'd all be um, doubtful. Uh, but I, I'm gonna agree with Blair Beekman on this. We shouldn't skimp on good news. 
Um, I think we've got a lot of good news. And so if folks will just bear with it, I, I would just like to recite a few of the statistics that give me reason to believe uh, we can actually get this done and be the first big city to actually get there. Um, it was all in the last few years that we've launched as a clean energy, which now provides residents and businesses with electricity or will starting January. That will be 92% GHG free. Uh, we've managed to protect nearly a thousand acres of Coyote Valley against development, uh, again with our partners at OSA and Post. And uh, we're preserving our foothills and open spaces in, in new ways as a result of Measure C. Uh, we became the largest U.S. city to require all electric construction of new buildings, commercial and residential. We became uh, the major U.S. metro with the greatest adoption of electric vehicles. Uh, and according to New York Times, we have the best EV infrastructure in the country. Uh, we've surpassed the implementation now of 400 miles of bike lanes and trails. We're on our way to 550 or 650. I can't remember this. 550, all right, we'll get to 652. But anyway, um, and, and most important, the quality of lanes is just dramatically improved from what we were seeing a decade ago, the segregated lanes, separated lanes, uh, safer and, and obviously much more inviting. Uh, we've used tools now like single bay permitting uh, for solar and battery storage. Uh, it makes us the third highest solar adopter in the country of any major city. Uh, and we've seen dramatic expansion to transit infrastructure that's under the way, under construction now, uh, as well as electrification of buses at the airport, buses at BCA, electrification of Caltrain. BART is under construction again very soon, and uh, light rail as well on the east side. So a lot going on, a lot more to do, of course. But all this, I think, should give us all heart that uh, we can get this done because we have accomplished so much together already. Um, I have several questions, um, and I'm looking for my colleagues to raise their hand. So if they're not, I'm going to go ahead and jump in um, and, and throw a few questions out because I'm kind of curious. I, I know we we're all wrestling with this emissions profile uh, and figuring out this is not an exact science. We know we're working hard to try to refine this. Did we ever figure out how we went from 62% of emissions from transportation down to 51%? Or is that basically, do we kind of concede we probably didn't calculate it right the first time around? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Jessica Zank, Deputy Director for the Department of Transportation. Thanks for having us. Uh, Yale is our resident data expert, so we will look to her if she has anything different to offer. But I think the key difference is that our the information at hand does continue to evolve, right, in terms of what we can measure, what we're able to measure in a given year, and then how that emissions profile uh, takes shape, right? So the 63% of emissions is based on our 2017 profile for the, the community as a whole, 51% based on the 2019 data. And, you know, Yale is still helping us all sift through differing data sources, some of which still point to that, you know, up to 60% range within the data that's out there. So I think it's, it suffices to say for us uh, simply that the, the profile from where things are and how we get to them, right. transportation and land use is, is huge. It's 50 to 60%. We can call it that and continue to work hard toward it. Whatever it is, it's the big share. It's the big share, yeah. exactly. It's definitely our fault. Can we go back to that slide that shows the pie chart? It was very early on in the presentation. I'm sorry, I don't have the exact page number. Somewhere around 10, I'm guessing. And as that's coming up, I'll just ask. Uh, there are different categories. Yep. Natural gas being one of them. Exactly. And then another being electricity. Yeah. Uh, and I understand that's looking at transit clean energy data, probably. And then we got another category for transportation, which is 51. Yep. So we know there's some overlap in different ways, right? There's some electric cars, for example. So does that fit in, <laughs> in terms of how we're trying to understand this? Um, I know we'd be double counting if we drew electric cars from both the electric share and the transportation share. What does it usually fit? Right, right, exactly. And I think here we go. I'm going to go backwards now. Again information to make sure we're all thinking of the same graphics. Here we go. There, there it is. That's it. Thank okay. you. Perfect. And so 
as was mentioned by Julie in the presentation, transportation in this 2019 emissions profile represented over 50%, 51%, and 88% of that was on road vehicles within there. So electric vehicles are a subset of that information, but depending on the source electricity, you know, the drawdown of electricity within San Jose, I believe, does show up in the 14%. Yeah, so just to clarify, so the any of the electricity used in San Jose is coming is shown in the electricity category. So even for our electric car charging, it's not separated out because I'm not even sure you could do that. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, so it's it's included in that electricity portion. It's not double counted. Is that what the Okay, yeah, that's kind of what I'm, I'm yeah. just trying to figure out where do we put it every time. Yeah, so an electric vehicle essentially would would somewhat um, not show up in that transportation in the emissions. Although I do think some of the callers brought up important points about the production of that electric vehicle and other right. things do also have an emissions profile. Yeah. yeah. As do buses and lots of other things we value. Um, so then do we view natural gas as just a proxy for building? Is there some other use of natural gas? Uh, thank you. It's predominantly buildings and whether that's residential or commercial manufacturing. Okay, thank you. And then that category says process and fugitive. <laughs> that had me curious what that all means. 9% of our emissions, we should blame fugitives for them. Yale, do you want to uh, give us the, the real answer? <laughs> Like gas escaping from something? Uh, so I'm Yael Kissel and I'm uh, the Climate Smart Analytics Lead and Projects Coordinator. Um, yes, so process and fugitive emissions includes industrial processes. So in past years, that included semiconductor manufacturing, although that no longer occurs in San Jose. And then fugitive emissions are leaked emissions. So that includes refrigerants as well as leaked natural gas. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I, I know that um, we've got real opportunities for funding through uh, OPR at the state level. Uh, and I know our friends at Save the Bay are particularly interested in some of the adaptation resilience work we can do with regard to green infrastructure. And I just wanna confirm um, that, that uh, uh, our interpretation, interpretation of uh, uh, green infrastructure, infrastructure sufficiently is sufficiently broad that may capture benefits for stormwater. So, yes, and at council direction, the city has been working much more across departments on urban greening. And I would just clarify that urban greening for, for our work is across, is across the board, board whether we're talking about the tree canopy, canopy uh, wildflowers, wildflowers and other, um, you know, you know surface, surface level visible infrastructure, infrastructure, especially that that provides other co benefits like shade, et cetera. Et cetera. Green, green infrastructure is also part of urban greening, but is specifically the green infrastructure or the, the ways in which the water is treated before getting into um, our, our, uh, our bay eventually, but also our stormwater system. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. And I know we'll be talking about Coyote Valley very soon next week. And I know we'll be talking about carbon credits and certainly look forward to exploring more of what we can do in that regard. You know, I can recall having this conversation, I don't know, three or four years ago about sort of our strategy and how we view sequestration. And then I generally understood from a few different sources that, look, there's a lot of value to natural working lands. In terms of protecting wildlife, providing clean air, a lot of, you know, reducing heat island effect, all those things are, are important, but didn't really understand the carbon sequestration value to be all that great, um, unless you're talking an enormous expanse of land. We're now seeing at least some preliminary analysis that suggests that Coyote could provide as much as 14% of sequestration of our, our carbon emissions. Um, just, could, could you help me? Are we learning more or are things changing? What, what's different? Well, thank you. Um, the natural working lands um, module that we 
co-partnered uh, with Open Space Authority on really provided us with a lot of new insight, but it also talks about assertive management, so not just leaving the land undeveloped, but doing things like how you could increase the sequestration value by applying biosolids that, that um, improves that performance. And so looking at steps that we can take to make it more valuable, um, and then certainly some of it is just volume of land. Okay. I look forward to, I know that analysis is still underway, so look forward to learning more as that comes out. Um, and then I will note, of course, we do have a significant budget surplus at the state level uh, we're hearing for the next year. And we certainly have a local delegation. I think about, you know, some of them are Colorado and Senator Cortese. And, uh, now, you know, now John Laird, a senator, former um, Natural Resources Secretary, all have a great interest in environmental issues. And I just want to encourage staff to think very creatively about those one time asks. I know that. We need staff to be sure, and that's an ongoing commitment we need to make from the city. But we think about the state, um, this is really our opportunity, I think, to do something really significant. Uh, and it may be around, for example, well, I don't know, uh, um, you know, we, we, we're thinking a lot about microgrids, for example. It's going to take a significant investment of dollars. Um, I, I really look forward to rolling up our sleeves. If, to identify those sort of one-time projects that our state delegation could really carry for us in a big way and, uh, and take us ahead. So uh, I, I think uh, we're, we're on a good path here. You know, we're leading the country in a lot of ways. I think we should continue to lead and, and lead even by a larger margin. Um, and maybe we'll host the next cop, uh, conference here in San Jose. That'd be a fun thing to do. Uh, except that we're gonna make everybody ride their bikes instead of flying on jet planes. Uh, Councilmember Cohen. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and I want to thank the staff for the report and the presentation today. Also, thank all of the uh, advocates who called in to provide input. It's all very, uh, uh, very um, good points that were made, and a, and a lot of important out things that we have to consider as we go forward. Um, I know that specifically Susan Butler Graham made a statement that I've been that's been I've been wrestling with with all since last week. That you know, this is the easy part, and I think even the mayor said this before. The easy part is passing this resolution, and I and I don't have any doubt actually that this council and this city have a strong um, desire to to achieve this, um, and that we all are behind this. Um, but the issue, of course, is how we get there once we pass this resolution. It's going to take a lot of work and a lot of commitment, and we have to be bold as a city. Um, and what I've been very impressed by is our uh, environmental services department and, and their commitment to this. I'm, I'm, I have no doubt that, that staff there is committed to finding the best ways to get the most bang for our buck as we move forward. Um, if you go back to that pie chart, we don't, we don't have to, but I mean, thinking about the pie chart, um, obviously net zero doesn't mean attacking the largest part of the pie chart. Net zero means the entire pie chart has to be gone in 10 years. Actually, it's nine, it's less than almost, almost just nine years now. So th that, that's a daunting thing to think about. It's not, it, it, that's why, um, from my perspective, when, we, when I thought about this, I don't wanna go into this limiting what the approach will be or, or presupposing what the directions will be. Um, I had a lot of great conversations, my staff and I, with Carrie and others in the department in the last couple of weeks. Um, and there's a lot of ideas out there, a lot of things we have to do, and we have to do them all in order to achieve this. <laughs> that's the challenging part. We're gonna to have to be committed with the resources. We're gonna to have to be committed with the, to do sometimes make hard, take, make hard choices uh, going forward um, because this vote today isn't gonna, isn't gonna get us there. Um, so, you know, when we first had this resolution, I, I thought, well, we, we, we should sort of write the resolution, leave it open-ended, um, have staff come back to us um, with, a, a specific plan, timelines, all the things we have to do to move forward. But, I, but you know, as, as we were seeing more ideas get tossed about, I thought it was important for us to make sure that we're aware as a council of what it will take to get to that point. And that's why I, um, I appreciated the, the memo with the mayor and council members, Davis, Prowlis, and Jimenez for getting us started, providing some of that input, talking about transportation, talking about looking at a plan for how we're gonna fund those positions ongoing. Um, and then, I started thinking about some other things that we also have to include in that in order to really get that pie chart to zero. 
Um, and that's where my memo came from uh, over the weekend, thinking about all the things that we've talked about in the past um, and, and some of the important priorities we're going to have to jump on right away in order to get there in nine years. Um, I want to say that I'm, it's an honor to serve with on a city in a city that is so committed to this and to be thinking about being the leader. Um, we had some comments about how San Jose will be washed by other cities and actually can be, um, can, others will learn from us, others will do things that we do. So we are going to be in the, in the eye. Um, people, you know, people will be watching going forward and, and using us as a model. So it's really important that we think about how to do this right um, and that we commit ourselves if we're going to take this vote today, um, which I, I hope we all will. Um, I do want to talk about the one, I think the one difference in our memo that I think will be the, the conflict question is my leaving out 1D from the, from the recommendation from the original memo. So um, just to get ahead of that one, um, I don't think that, you know, I personally or others have any intention of saying we're going to stop development. I mean, you know, I think we've all had these conversations. I'm very in favor of making sure we build the dense development, we get moving on development, we build more housing as we're needed for all of our affordability issues. But I also think that as we move forward, it's really important for us to keep in mind as we push for the development that we're going to have to push the boundaries a bit with people who are coming forward with development or as a city to put resources in to help them um, to make standards better so that future developments are getting us closer to our goal and not helping and not pushing us further away from the goal. So I, it's not necessarily a statement to say we would stop any development, but what I put into my memo was uh, the idea of um, asking the environmental department to work with planning on what we can do as far as future design standards to make sure that future developments are better and helping us close this gap. So to me, it's a transition period. It won't necessarily affect things in the short term as much, but it will push us to be working with our partners in the development community um, to make things better going forward. And so that's kind of the reason I, I made that, that uh, distinction between that item and what's in my memo. Um, the other two things I just wanted to mention from my memo um, are making sure that we're, we're appropriately funding the staff that's needed in the department. Um, I know we have the staff now, it was paid for from the grant from Bloomberg, and I hope we can continue to have grants like that, but we should make a commitment as a city that we'll fund it no matter what, so that we don't have to worry about people thinking, well, is my job safe? Are we gonna get the best staff for these jobs? We have to make a commitment that no matter how we fund it, and we should try to get the grant funding to pay for it, but we should make a commitment that those positions are safe and stable. Um, and there was one other. Oh, oh the other part is, is um, for me, it, it's important for us to be very clear in our staff memos across the city about how they affect um, our goal of going to carbon zero by 2030. Um, we have a climate smart item in each of the memos, but sometimes they're very, uh, they're just perfunctory statements. They're not very clear. If things are might actually be harmful towards that goal, we don't really get that message in the memo. And while it may or may not change our outcome on the memos, we should always understand, if this is a priority of our city, how anything we're doing has an effect. So I wanna make sure that we work to tighten up that language and, and do a better job. Um, so I would like, having explained my, the, you know, where I am on this, I would like to make a motion to adopt my memo. Um, and uh, we welcome further discussion on it after that. Is that a motion, Councilman? Or is that? Yeah, that's a motion. All right. Is there a second? All right, we'll, we'll return to it. Maybe, Maybe can I just I? raise a question or two about um, a couple of issues? Just want to make sure we get clarification. Um, assuming if we were, this were to become a motion and we're seconded the, the budget recommendations, I mean, ultimately, that's, that's up to us uh, every March in the budget process. So I wouldn't want to get outside that process. Uh, clearly, um, City Manager is going to bring forward her recommendations, and then we have a chance as a council to decide what permanent, what's not. That is what's ongoing, what's not, since there's nothing permanent in our world. Um, 
so I, I would just ask if ultimately this becomes part of a recommendation that uh, this is something that's brought forward in the budget process. Um, that, that was my expectation. Okay. I didn't really expect anything beyond that. I just wanted us, the main goal for me was to make, have us as a council commit to that, sort of think about that ahead of time and, and, and have it in our heads before we go into the budget discussion that this is a priority of ours when we get to that budget process. Mental commitment is uh, certainly appropriate. Uh, we just uh, don't want to make any uh, public commitments until we've got it all in front of us. Um, um, and, then, and then secondly, with regard to the issue on item 1D, perhaps maybe I could offer a bit of an explanation because I don't think we disagree in concept. Um, I fully expect that whether it's in design standards or the general plan, this council will be mindful of its goal of, of zero emissions by 2030 and crafting those policies to ensure we have a very clear approach to what we approve and what we don't, and we have smart growth principles and so forth. The challenge is if this policy is taken out, um, out of the context of those other policies, and it's used as a basis for saying, I don't like this housing project. And I think we all know if you build a multifamily high density project out of eggshells on top of a transit station, it's 100% affordable, it's still gonna have greenhouse gas emissions. It's still gonna increase your greenhouse gas emission profile. So the problem is there's literally nothing that could satisfy a standard that says if it increases our emission profile, then it must not happen. And so I want to avoid the logical conclusion there and get us all to agree that we're gonna make sure that this goal drives all of our policies and it's not going to be some separate policy that we take out of the air that's somehow or another independent or inconsistent with the larger policies that we've, we've announced. And that's, that's, that was the meaning of 1D because I know you wouldn't do this, but others might <laughs> who, who might uh, decide that they don't like a particular housing project for one reason or another. And by that I'm not talking, I don't mean disparaging council members, I mean uh, there are plenty of folks, whether using legal uh, ends, that is uh, through lawsuits or whatever else, may attempt to use policies in ways that I think undermine goals that I think we would all naturally embrace. So that is, that is my fundamental concern, that if we believe in this approach, we believe in this goal, we make sure it's part of a policy that lives somewhere in this city uh, and that it's not used as a sword or as a, as a shield. Um, okay, so I, I'm not able to see other folks in the, on Zoom right now raise their hand. Let me see Council if I can. Member Perales has his hand up. Thank you, Councilmember Perales. Yeah, thank you very much, Mayor. Um, and first off, I appreciate the presentation, the discussion today, uh, all the experts that, that uh, participated and, and helped to, to educate us. I think we uh, know a lot through, whether it's anecdotally or news, our own readings, and um, just I think how severe this climate change issue is. Um, unfortunately, I think there are, um, you know, there are all alternative theories out there. And so as much as I think all of this presentation discussion, this severity makes sense to us um, today, um, I think it's also just important to remember that uh, there are alternative views out there that, that are going to make this even that much more challenging to achieve, um, especially when you consider, as the mayor was pointing out, the, the real work is really going to be done locally in cities, um, and and we're going to have uh, a lot of uh, of other cities that may not share the same understanding that, that we do today, um, or have the same scientific evidence based presentations uh, that we have today. And so um, it, it is even that much more important that I think on the side of of science and, and really in respect for future generations of, of not only mankind, but, but this, or humankind, but this entire um, planet and that we do our part. And so I, I appreciate the, um, the goals and the ambitions that, that the staff have laid out and um, the mayor uh, being able to work with you in, in your Brown Act on, I think being able to, to now act on those goals and see if we can't have um, an opportunity of actually achieving them, understanding all of the challenges that we have um, in front of us as well. And, and so I, I also appreciate Councilmember um, Cohen's additional work. My, my two concerns actually were in, in regards to 
um, what you had brought up, Mayor, the, the number one on the budget, um, I think we just don't make any of those commitments prior to the budget. Um, even within our, our, right, our, our, our budgets that we approve every single year, we know that there's always uh, fluctuation and, and we have our base budget of support services from city staff. Um, but uh, even those are, are up for debate, especially when we have budget deficits. Um, but at the same time, I understand and I actually agree with Councilmember Cohen. It was just, I think, the, the wording of, of the language there to ensure that we're not making decisions leading up to the budget, but that uh, I actually agree with him that we should be sort of teeing that up and knowing that this, these grant dollars for those positions are going away, um, that we should be considering whether it's maybe on a one-time basis right now in the short term, uh, but then ultimately that, that those should be rolled into um, a base budget in the future and that should be part of a dialogue. Um, my, my concern with eliminating 1D, um, a number of reasons that the, the mayor, you pointed out, um, one, and really that the ability to be able to utilize that as maybe an opportunity to kill projects. Um, but I actually, I think that there's an opportunity that we have to incentivize on the other end, uh, and not just to get to what we've had, which is, you know, this uh, lead, uh, right, platinum standards and gold standards, um, of, of the sustainability of a project. When, when we analyze those types of developments, we're looking at the ongoing operation of a development. So once it's built, um, how is it operating and what is its impact on the environment? And I was having um, a very interesting conversation with um, the founder of West Bank, Ian Gillespie, on, on really that, the next level of development that doesn't just look at post-development, but it looks at pre-development standards and how are you sourcing material, um, right? What, what is the actual imprint, the, the, the footprint that the development itself has on, um, on a local community or on the world itself um, all, all from literally from, from starting from, from scratch, from ground zero, and then every single um, material that you're bringing in, uh, where is that coming from? How is that impact uh, impacting the project? And overall, can the project from start to finish be something um, that is net zero. And uh, I think that we, we need to be thinking of that in regards to how we are incentivizing projects moving forward in the future. And so I think on, on two, two ends, this 1D is important because it gives us some, some leverage, especially with development, uh, gives us leverage, but then it also ensures that we're not giving a lot of leverage away um, for the opportunity for people to come in and maybe solve projects that we know are extremely important as you point out, a 100% affordable project uh, that may not get there because of the levels of cost may not get to a 100%, um, at least not you know, today or over the next couple of years, get there to where they're at that level of, 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 of being able to, to be uh, net neutral or, or, or be able to, to be net zero um, and, and ultimately give somebody the, the opportunity to, to stop a number of our affordable projects. Uh, it's a major challenge. I think we know we have uh, both at hand. This crisis, uh, climate crisis, inevitably uh, is the biggest, um, right, in, in, in all of our futures. Um, and so I think it's important that we set out these goals and we create the tools necessary to be able to do so. And I, I do really think that there's an opportunity in this 1D um, to go much further as, as we, we look to our development uh, policies and standards over the next uh, couple of years. And uh, I think we'll have an opportunity to do that. Uh, so I'd like to, to, to leave that in. Uh, otherwise, I, I'm comfortable with Councilmember Cohen's um, memo and just, again, that clarification on the, the funding portion there that we're not um, preempting anything. We're just obviously giving that, that, in, uh, that urge of, of a direction, um, but then leaving in the 1D. So I, I'm, I'm willing to make a motion here that would include um, the memo that I signed on to jointly with uh, the mayor, uh, Councilmember Jimenez and Davis and then also include uh, council member uh, Cohen's memo uh, striking um, his recommendation number two, and then just clarifying uh, the budget that that's a, a direction that, that, that we'll just uh, incorporate into our conversation uh, during our budget discussion. Second. And that's it for my uh, comments and that's the motion mayor. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, you Councilman Cross. Cross. Uh, support the motion. motion. Uh, I can't, I can't tell Councilmember Council Foley or may hands first. I'm sorry. They raised their hand at the same time. Okay, Councilmember Foley. <laughs> <laughs> Alphabetic order. <laughs> that that or or number first or female or age before beauty or whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> all fair. All fair. 
uh, thank you so much for the presentation. It was very helpful, very informative. All the different component of it, components of it uh, were really helpful to me. Uh, this goal, this carbon neutrality goal by 2030 is laudable, but it's really not going to be easy. And I appreciate what my council members have said and what the members of the community have said. We can say as long as we want to that we want to reach net, net uh, carbon neutrality, but how we get there and making sure that we're accountable to get there is really the difficulty. So I, I just want to emphasize that this is something that while, while we can take the lead on this and we should take the lead and we must take the lead as, as, as one of the largest cities in the country, is that we really need the help of the state and federal government and partners to help us fund these initiatives. The mayor's memo identifies transportation as a key opportunity to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Indeed, transportation is the largest contributor of emissions in San Jose, and so there's a lot of work that needs to be done there to reduce emissions. Getting real funding to support a transportation demand management plan is going to be the key for that. Electrification of private automobiles has a role to play in bringing us into our carbon neutral future. However, big changes are going to need to be to take place in our transportation network to fully realize carbon neutrality. That means placing transit first, eliminating parking minimums, building out our bicycle infrastructure and giving our residents alternative, al alternatives to a single occupancy vehicle to meet their transportation demand. And that means improving mass transit so people can get to work without depending on their vehicle. I also appreciate Council Member Cohen's memorandum, uh, but I appreciate the motion that's on the table because the one objection I had besides the, the budget implication is that uh, 1D I feel is an important criteria. We know that as a city, we can grow while still reducing greenhouse emissions. I'm concerned that our climate smart goals may be construed to block infield transit oriented development and we don't want that to happen. Our vote today is important for our city, for the planet, and more importantly, for our children. I have a couple of questions and a couple of uh, statements. Actually, in Councilmember Collins' or, uh, email or uh, memo, he talks about uh, creating, uh, developing standards for future development for solar panels and also assisting homeowners with retrofitting so uh, to provide energy efficiency on in their homes. I just wanna offer that there are, while the city may not have that financial capability, there are partners who may be able to through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Those are funding sources who have energy efficiency loan programs that a homeowner can benefit from by purchasing energy efficient uh, water heaters, gas, uh, converting from gas powered to electrical water heaters, and installing solar panels, there's PACE loans, there's all sorts of opportunities in, uh, in, the, in the lender world, the banker world, that we may be able to partner with them as far as finding ways to provide funding sources. So has staff, I, uh, is, I would encourage staff to work with uh, some of the lender institutions, uh, not me, I'm a mortgage broker, I don't do these loans, full disclosure, but they are available and they're low interest rates and they're an opportunity both for a homeowner, but also for a land uh, property owner who can pass on the savings to their tenants and reduce greenhouse gas emissions by the type of, pro of uh, uh, appliances and such that they're swapping out in their homes. Um, so my main concern is staffing. These are great goals, but without the right staffing, we won't be able to track, monitor, and make sure that all of these things are being implemented. So how are we situated as far as our staff is concerned and what staffing do we need, will we need, and can, is there ending, any grant funding available that does not expire next year? 
or that is sustainable, like our environment? Uh, that, that's a big question. Um, we have about five staff funded uh, to work on Climate Smart. But, but the thing about Climate Smart is it rolls into many city programs. So it's about the people that um, have that in their job title, but it's also about how all of us do our work in a climate smart way. And so um, when we look at new programs, we wanna make sure we're not, it's not sort of that climate smart person's job. Um, but having said that, the, the planning and the thoughtfulness around programs and the support to departments uh, citywide and, um, and other stakeholders is, um, is and will be significant. So other cities like um, San Diego has over 20, Seattle has over 20, Boston has over 20, Austin has about 20, um, Palo Alto has 12. So, so clearly we're on the low end and, um, and, and we need to figure that out. I, I like to think because we're, we're very efficient and that's good, but I also like to think that we have thousands of city staff that are, um, are supporting Climate Smart in their normal activities. Um, so we don't have a number of people we need, but but we do um, we do know that we need to go get additional grant funding. Um, someone like like Yale is um, is on one time funding right now, and and is, is someone that we uh, we need to keep to get the data right. And um, and so we're actively looking at grants. We've um, got how much money so far this year? Three or four hundred thousand. Yeah, four hundred thousand. About four hundred thousand uh, dollars fiscal year to date. And uh, and we'll keep uh, keep marching forward with that. As um, as several of you have noticed uh, or brought forward, there's a lot of opportunity for external funding right now, and um, and we're gonna um, hit the hit the streets as soon as the vote concludes. So so Carrie, just a follow up question to that: Does adopting this 2030 commitment? potentially open us up to greater funding and more uh, bigger dollars from some of these environmental funders? Definitely. The external um, funding community, the philanthropic community has shared with us that they want to invest in cities that uh, want to be invested in and that, and that want to make these changes and leave. And do they also have, besides funding, do they also have experts who might be able to assist us in reaching these goals? Many of them do have experts. Um, what we learned from the Bloomberg uh, American Cities Climate Cities Challenge is it's those third, it's those on those resources that we can tap into very quickly that help move us faster because we don't have to procure them, we don't have to find them, um, and we we don't need to find the money to use them. And so uh, Elena Omado and, and others that have supported us have been a dramatic help. And so a lot of the grantors are moving in that direction. And that's something that we would try and weave into grants as we have that opportunity because it's been very efficient. Great, wonderful, thank you. That's the end of my questions. I appreciate the presentation and I look forward to voting yes. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Mayhem. Thanks Mayor and thanks Councilmember Foy. Appreciate your comments. Certainly, uh, certainly wisdom before you. Uh, appreciate uh, your perspective there, and um, you know, I, I appreciate the, um, the the report today and public comment and my colleagues' memos, which you know I'll, I'll be happy to vote in favor of. I, I'm very supportive of the vision and the aspirational goal here. I think the reality is that this climate crisis is significant enough, probably the single biggest risk our species faces, that even if we fall short of the goal, it's right to set an aggressive goal and, and do everything we can to try to, to try to reach it. So that's why I'll be voting yes. I, I do want to say, though, at the same time, I do have some hesitation about voting for an ambitious goal without really understanding uh, what it's going to take and, or what our assumptions are. Generally, I like to see the math first. And I think the reality is none of us here voting yesterday, presumably all, we all will vote yes because we agree with the aspirational goal. I'm not sure any of us really understand what we're voting for in practice. I, I think that the, what the trade-offs are, what the required investments are gonna be, I think we have some good high-level theories, but I, I really wanna see the math. I, you know, concern for 
our climate and our environment is what led me to join the Clean Energy Commission quite a few years, four years ago now, I think, when it was first started. And, you know, the reality is that even when we have a, a, um, an offering for consumers that is 92% renewable on the label, the reality is it's not 92% renewable energy in practice. We buy credits. And so my sense is that to get anywhere close to carbon neutrality by 2030, we're going to have to be very aggressive about credits and offsets and sequestration because we're still, I think, very likely to have gas-powered cars out there. There'll be a lower percentage of the mix. There'll still be homes hooked up to natural gas. There's still, we, we know that this transition is going to be extremely difficult and time-consuming. So I'm very supportive, but I really, I do want to better understand what we think the implementation path looks like, what kinds of investments are assumed, what the trade-offs are. I think the hard part in the years ahead is going to be talking about um, what we're willing to forego, what trade-offs we're, we're willing to make. And I, I think we're kind of saying aspirationally, this is what we want. I agree, but um, I'm not sure we, I, I, you know, I, I hope we get to that conversation soon. I did want to ask specifically on slide 27, Carrie, am I reading correctly? Are the orange dots meant to, do they mean that we have nearly cut our emissions in half since 2008, or am I misreading that? Gary? Uh, sorry about that. I'm uh, trying to find that slide 27. Um, my recollection is that that would be the path of um, a curve, the um, race to zero targets. Well, the, the orange yeah, dots, yeah. Are the, oh, the, the, the dots are the race to zero targets. You want to answer that? Yeah. <laughs> Please. Uh, yeah. So the orange, it's I think the next slide. slide or next slide. There we go. Yeah, the orange dots are inventory so far, and you're correct that well, it's not quite cutting in half, but we have decreased emissions by a lot. And, and so, okay, so that, those are inventories of the sectors that we're focused on, which presumably are the largest ones. What has led to the biggest change here in, what, what has allowed us to nearly cut emissions in half since 2000? I mean, that's great news, and that does give me hope that we can continue that trend, but what's been the biggest driver of that reduction? Yeah, so the, the largest shifts are um, decreases in transportation emissions due to basically cleaner vehicles mostly, and the incredible shift that we've seen in the electricity grid, it's become much cleaner, and that's been a huge difference. I mean, it made a huge difference. And on the, okay, thanks. On the vehicle front, my understanding is that electric vehicles are still far less than half of the fleet out there. So if, if transportation is the largest contributor to emissions, and the biggest driver of this decline, but electrification is still a small fraction of the vehicles on the road. Is that, is that just implying that um, fuel efficiency has gone up dramatically since then? Yeah, fuel efficiency has also, is a, is a big piece of the puzzle. Okay. And, Could and I just ask if you could speak a little more directly in the mic? Thank oh, you. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so it's fuel efficiency as well as vehicle electrification and some reduction in VMT, I believe. Right. And then on the power sector side, back to the point about buying credits. I mean, my understanding is you know, the highest point of energy demand during the day is the evening when people get home. It's five to nine. Everybody gets home, turns on all the lights and the dishwasher and the washing machine and all the rest. Um, and that's also when the sun starts setting, particularly in the winter, um, and we have less access to that energy. So what, what assumption, maybe we're not ready to have this conversation yet, but I guess I'm curious what assumptions about storage or, or I hesitate to mention it, but nuclear or what, what are the technologies that are going to get us there? Because even when we put 92% on the label, we're burning the fossil fuel. We're still getting power from gas powered peaker plants. We're just buying the credits from some other place that's, that's setting up solar and wind at a different time of day. So do we... Have we kicked the tires at all on our ability to actually get close to this goal by 2030? 
Thank you. We, um, we believe that, again, dramatic shift will need to occur. I believe we will, credits will be a piece of that puzzle. And when we look at this as being a global effort, if we need to create an inflection point that involves getting um, value out of another part of uh, the world or of the United States, I think that's okay. And then in the long term, as long as we bring everything up to carbon neutrality, I think we'll be fine. But, um, but I do think there will still be gasoline vehicles in 2030. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that credits will be a part of it. I know that's not our long-term aspiration to have credits be a part of it, but I don't see how we get there without them. Right. Okay. All right. Um, well, I, I, I'm really looking forward to getting deeper into what percentage of this plan is going to require credits and offsets and basically us kind of buying our way out through the through a, led, a global ledger system versus what's going to actually be a reduction in emissions locally and then what those investments and trade-offs are going to be. Because I'm all for signing up for the aspirational goal, but I think we're kind of punting on the actual tough decisions we're going to have to make. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks again for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any additional, uh, Councilmember Carrasco. Councilmember Carrasco. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry. I'm having some issues and I'm not sure if you can hear me, Mayor. Could you not? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you for an excellent presentation. It's an alarming presentation, I must, I must say, as uh, as someone who is uh, does everything that she can, as most moms do, to secure her children's future and to think of uh, of uh, doomsday, which is just around the corner. And we got we must do everything that we can to uh, preserve our our children's future. This is this is frightening. It's uh, it's a, a scary thought of uh, what might be if we don't act swiftly. And so I appreciate, um, I appreciate the, the presentation and I truly appreciate uh, the efforts uh, by our staff, uh, given uh, that what we do today uh, has just real clear implications and consequences, ramifications, and of course, um, uh, uh, clear benefits. Uh, for the city of San Jose and one of the largest cities uh, in the country. So thank you, everybody. I'll be supporting the memo. Uh, you know, uh, th this may seem like small pickings. And so I just wanted to thank the mayor and my colleagues for including one of the items that is uh, near and dear at this point, and it's become uh, almost a thorn in my side, which is your item 1C mayor. Uh, the heat island and the tree planting. And I just wanted to touch on that just very, very slightly uh, because this has become an issue that I didn't realize what a, a, a mountain I was going to have to climb to try and plant a tree on the east side of San Jose. And if I could just elaborate a little and see if there's any way, and I don't know if this is the a place where we can elaborate on it or if, if maybe down the line we can uh, build upon it. But if there is any way that we could explore further on how we can uh, look for greater funding or explore policies uh, in order to build out this urban canopy in areas such as D7, D5, and lo and behold, D4, which are the three districts that are uh, woefully behind some of the other districts in the city of San Jose. Uh, you know, we, we, are, um, we are experiencing such a scarcity in our tree canopy, it's truly alarming. And I will tell you, if we're looking at transportation as one of the key indicators or one of the key factors, when we look at our at our um, uh, carbon neutrality. Well, I wouldn't have to get in a car and go to Willow Glen or any part of the city of San Jose if I could just enjoy my side of, of town and be able to uh, be sheltered from the elements if I only had an urban canopy or if I could in good conscience encourage my residents uh, or at, 
at least figure out with my arborist how to do that, or if I could even find a place where to do it. The east side of San Jose is completely paved over. We don't even have places where to do it. And now we have to actually consider breaking up pavement. So I, I just want to emphasize it every single time that we are going to talk about this. And, and this brings me to another point. Uh, we, we have to start truly talking about the wonderful and beautiful assets that we have on the east side of San Jose. And if we're going to talk about people not getting in their cars and staying locally, then we have to continue to talk about investing in our assets and actually following through on those allocations and truly building out those assets that we have and keeping open space as open space so that families can stay there and not, not continue to move into uh, those areas. I see. I'm sorry, I'm getting, yes. Okay, gotcha. Got the message loud and clear. So, uh, so I'm, I'm just putting it out there. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and I appreciate you including this in the memo, Mayor. I don't know if you just want to say anything out publicly. Oh, yes. Yes, I was, uh, <laughs> you called me out. I had just texted uh, Councilman Crosco indicating I was very interested in uh, seeing how we could dig in on this issue. Uh, I think it's going to require probably a public campaign to really get residents to embrace watering the trees at the same time we commit the dollars. And I think I also want to make sure we follow through on something that we'd articulated before, which was uh, giving liability waivers to property owners uh, over issues of trees. I think there are things that we can do and we really need to do. And so I, I absolutely em embrace seeing what we can do here. I know it's not a, a huge emissions issue, but it's a huge quality of life issue. Yeah. And, uh, and so I, I do want to say that uh, I think that we, we have to uh, look at uh, at this through that equity lens that we've talked about uh, so often and we've repeated it on numerous occasions through different uh, items throughout the past couple of years, but looking at it through those neighborhoods that have been impacted through COVID, uh, those neighborhoods that, are, that have been underinvested, uh, those areas that uh, are lacking in resources, uh, in this case, it would be the urban canopy, uh, but to be able to look at that. But something also that Council Member Foley said, uh, she was referring to uh, residents who are tenants, for example. Well, they're not homeowners. They, they're not incentivized uh, the way that homeowners are, or maybe they don't qualify in the same way uh, to put in solar panels or to, you know, whatever the homeowners uh, qualify for or are, are incentivized in the same manner. They're, they're not going to have the same kind of benefits uh, that homeowners have. So we're not talking about being able to, you know, uh, add the same kinds of things to their homes the way that others can. And so you're not going to see that, for example, in District 5. Uh, and so, so that's a huge concern in terms of uh, some of the things that we're talking about uh, regarding these issues. And, and, and that's, that's just, a, you know, for my residents, it's a huge concern. Okay, uh, does Steph want to respond? Or? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Carrasco. Just a reminder that the city's first community forest management plan uh, is expected to be presented in mid-December. Uh, so another good time to uh, really dig into the item. Thank you. Okay. Um, Councilman Cohen, uh, your light's still on. Is that from before? Yeah, but, yeah, but I wanted to speak again. again. Okay, go for it. <laughs> Um, um, well, I want, well, I want to thank you, everyone, for the discussion, discussion uh, that, that, we, that followed um, my opening comments. Um, the few things I want to respond to, and then a, a, question, a, a suggested amendment I'd like to ask for. Um, several people have talked about how we can raise the money to do this, um, and I, I appreciate Councilmember Foley's idea or talking about how we facilitate um, helping people get access to resources that are out there. Um, so. Just want to make sure that uh, we understand that there's a lot of resources I think waiting out there to be given to cities that are committed to this, and you know it's going to take some effort to raise some money. Um, I don't know. Obviously, my memo came out early, just as today, but 
I was very moved just to find out a week ago about the example in Ithaca, New York, and I, it was in my discussion, but I want to just repeat it for everybody to, to hear. Um, Ithaca has a total city budget of $80 million, and they made a commitment two weeks ago to become the first city in the United States to go completely electric, and it was not what we did in San Jose to say that new projects are going to go electric, but they want to retrofit every building and house in the city to go completely electric, and they, they committed to do that by 2030. And they're doing it, and they said it won't affect our budget, our city budget. We're doing it with private money, and that's the only way we're going to pay for it. And um, so they have already, in just a couple weeks, raised $100 million from private sources to do that. And that's because there are private sources out there that want this to happen. And so they've raised more money than their entire city budget just to do that conversion. And so I believe that through the private sector, we can get this done. And I, I do appreciate Councilmember Frasco's comment about renters. This isn't just about facilitating residents, but facilitating properties. We can put people to work. We can, we can make people more, make things more energy efficient, and we can save people money on their um, utility bills all at the same time. So I just want to, to point out that this, this is hard, but it's not undoable. And there will be a lot, I think, of, of intention on us if we make this commitment. Um, I know there were questions about, I mean, I know that Councilmember Mayhan was concerned about, um, you know, whether we can really achieve this goal. Of course, we, sh we should set aspirational goals. We never achieve them if we don't. Um, and, and the trade-offs are necessary. I mean, not knowing what the trade-offs are, you know, in this case, unfortunately, we've see, we saw the dire report from IPP, IPC, IPPC, IPCC, I always forget, <laughs> but anyway, um, that if we don't do this, the consequences will be even more dire and the economic effect will be even greater. I, in, my, in my mind, there really isn't a question of trade-off. The, the trade-off is we don't do it, we spend more in the long run. So um, I, I don't know that there's anything more important than what we're, we're doing here today for everybody in our city. And I think we should be focused first on communities that haven't always had access. Um, this is an equity issue. There are a lot of people who are upgrading, putting on solar, buying electric cars and a lot of people who as of now haven't had access. And if we set a goal of the city of getting to carbon neutrality, we can go first to the places that are not yet upgraded and, and provide those resources to get that done. Um, so just to the point about item 1D, I fully, I fully support keeping it in there. I, you know, I, I think I was trying to find a way to balance my comments about saying that we need to improve developments in the future and not have the, the statement in there that would detract from that. But it wasn't ever intended to be a statement that we would cancel projects. Having said that, there are um, so many things that go into the question about whether development is helping us reach our goal. If we build more density and we get more people closer to their jobs and people out of their cars as a result of the development, then that may offset the carbon cost of building the project in the first place. And I think that's been our goal all along with developments we're doing. So I don't think that, that the developments we're approving are actually counter to our, our uh, carbon neutrality goal. But I would like to add, ask about the um, Council Member Perales, if he would accept a friendly amendment to add a 4E to my memo, which would just add an extra statement about developing, based on what he said actually in his comments, developing design standards for construction and development to reduce cost, carbon cost of construction, just putting that explicitly in the memo so that going forward, we can find ways to reduce the um, carbon effects of the building of these projects. Yes, I'm, I'm fine with that. I think obviously it will require a lot more conversation baked out, but uh, that, that recommendation is asking we come back to committee and I do think that it's a worthwhile conversation. Okay, thank you. I know our, our second was Council Member Davis, is that right? And she, maybe, yeah. she's online. Okay, I know she was trying Sorry. to get out of the parking garage in time. Uh, and I just, okay got out the park, I just got out of the parking garage and I didn't hear the, um, I'm sorry about that. I didn't hear the motion, the amendment. The amendment was to add another recommendation to come back to committee with ideas for developing those construction standards that Council Member Perales talked about um, in order to reduce the carbon footprint of the building of projects in the future. That, that sounds good. Thank you. Happy to accept that. Great. Okay. Uh, I think those are all the comments from the council. So we have a motion. Let's 
vote on that motion. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Aye. Thank you. All right. Uh, the motion is approved unanimously of all those present. Um, I don't believe we have public comment after today's session, is that right? Okay, so the meeting's adjourned and tomorrow morning, uh, tomorrow afternoon, I should say, we'll be back to council. So thanks everybody. Now comes the hard work.